Ah, clouding up out there and the wind's blowing. Maybe it isn't going to rain. I guess that's in the forecast. Today, we're going to take a little different approach to the sermon. We're going to get dirt on something. We're going to get the dirt, as they say, on a parable. I think you'll find it interesting getting the dirt on a parable because the parable's about that. But we need to talk about something else before we get there. What kind of person are you? I mean, personality-wise. You know, they're the... Uh, Psychologists have various ways of quantifying uh, pe you know, people's personalities. And then there are, there, they probably have technical words that we would have to get a Latin dictionary to translate. But uh, then there are the more common ways of analyzing you know, different people personality-wise. Um, you, you probably heard of this, the, uh, the lion, the beaver, the otter, and the golden retriever. And that's, that's a common way of analyzing the, what are considered to be the four basic personality types. I think if there was another interesting animal, we might have had five, but they limited it to only four. So if you are a leader type person, you sort of take charge of things, you're a lion. You know, when you, you know, people get together and they do this little thing of asking questions to try to determine what your personality is like, which, you know, has a certain benefit. Not quite as much as you, I think is sometimes portrayed. But if you like to do things, you know, especially plug up holes and work hard, then you're a beaver. You know, the beaver's always a busy doer, always doing things. But if you could care less and you just like being happy, you know, how did that song go? Uh, don't worry, be happy. If that was your personality, then you're an otter. And you know what an otter is. It's a... Yeah, it's a mink that swims, basically. A lot. You know, all minks can swim, but otters are bigger than, a little bit bigger than minks, and, and uh, they swim really a lot. And then if you're the kind of person that tries to please everybody and tries to make things all kind of work together and, you know, can't we all just get along kind of a person, a fixer of problems, then you're a golden retriever. Now, I don't know if they would have, as I was just reading a uh, couple of articles here this past week you know, in between and betwixt um, about bird dogs and golden retrievers are called retrievers because they're bird dogs which means you shoot a bird it falls out of the sky they run and get it and bring it back to you uh, they can't fix the bird <laughs> all they can do is bring it back to you and they got Labrador retrievers and Chesapeake retrievers and all kinds of other dogs that retrieve. We even had a German Shepherd that would retrieve. Another German Shepherd we had would eat whatever he, whatever he retrieved, but she would bring them back to us. She was a good dog. Uh, the, the beauty of it was that she was, had an affinity for or cold water. She didn't really care about cold water. She would break through the ice in a river to get to the duck that my cousin or I had shot, she'd swim, you'd break and swim, run out there, zero degrees, you know, 10 inches of snow on the ground. She'd break through the ice at the edge of the hole because there were certain places the currents would keep, keep it open, and that's why the duck was there. And uh, she would jump in and grab that duck, climb back out, run and drop it at our feet, and she was ready to go again. Uh, best dog we ever had for that. We have had other dogs that would grab the duck and go eat it, but uh, Frosty was, was like that. So probably you've, you've run across these four personality types, and, and uh, in the course of the discussion, you decided whether you were found out whether you were a lion or a beaver or an otter or a golden retriever. It is of some value. I'm not saying it isn't by any means. It is of some value to understand what your personality type is. However, God is more interested in what kind of spiritual character we have. So that's what we, we want to look at. And we're going through to go through um, the parable of the sower. So again, the title is The Sower and the Soil. We'll change the parameters. And instead of asking what kind of animal or color or season, because those are the other four ways that describe the personality types. You, I forget which color is one. And I would think the lion would be yellow, but then you might be cowardly, and then that wouldn't work for the lion. Um, but they have, the, they have four colors that they try to describe people as colors or seasons. I still don't know which one the lion would be in the seasons. 
But then again, that's not our, our main concern today. Uh, but we'll find out what kind of dirt we are. We're going to look at a new way to analyze not your personality so much as our character. What kind of dirt are you? And what can you do about it? There's the question. What kind of dirt? There are four kinds of dirt that we'll use. And we'll go with the four. That works fine. There's hard packed dirt that you would find on a road or a trail where the horses and the covered wagons would come by and pack it down hard. That's really hard packed dirt. Or you, the second type of dirt is shallow dirt on rocks. And I don't mean on the ice cubes. I mean on rocks. You know, dirt that, that is just a little bit of dirt and a lot of rocks. Either they're individual rocks or a rock shelf or something, but uh, whatever the case, the dirt is shallow and it's on rocks. And you think, well, what's the difference with the rocks? Rocks collect heat from the sun, even if they're a little bit underground. So you, you have hot soil. Hot soil causes generation plants or seeds to generate, uh, or rather to sprout more quickly and come out and get going faster. So that, that's why it's of note. And then our fourth kind is simply good, rich, fertile soil. The kind of stuff that Ohio is famous for. Did I only give you three? Oh, oh, sorry. Let me give you the third soil. That was the good, rich, fertile soil is four. Uh, dirt that is full of weeds and thorn, thorn seeds. That's what I'm, was the third one. Dirt full of weeds and thorns. I'll give a classic example of that. We, um, we had Canadian thistles in South Dakota. I don't know how they got down there, but they migrated south and landed in our cornfield. And uh, Canadian thistles are aggressive. They blow out all kinds of seed pods, uh, and they can't use them for anything. I suppose if we harvested them early with, like we would with hay, you could probably bale them. I don't think they would be hard and thistly after the, after there, but when they got in the cornfield, they would take over in a cornfield and eat up the crop's space to grow. I mean, very fast. So one, one time my father it took a, it was a patch of corn about half the size of this room, and he sterilized the soil with atrazine, which is a very powerful uh, weed killer that kills everything for three years. So that was a bare spot in the field for three years. And we would, we pheasant hunted through those fields and walked through them when we were irrigating. And you'd walk out and I said, well, this is where the thistles were. And you look around and they're sure enough dead. There are none there this year, and there won't be next year, and there won't be the year after that. Then, that, then the soil will recover, and it'll start to grow other things. Uh, but had he, had he not gotten the Canadian thistle, you know how their little seed pods catch the wind and go flying and plant themselves elsewhere, uh, we'd have been a terrible plague. So uh, uh, the third kind of dirt is full of weed and thorn seeds. Canadian thistles would come under that category in an agricultural setting. Now let's look at the parable of the sower. We will uh, be looking at it in two places specifically, although there's covered in Mark. We're going to look at the Matthew version and the Luke version. We'll read Matthew's first in chapter 13 of Matthew. The sower and the soil. Matthew 13. It starts right off with the, par the parable that we're looking at. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat, and he sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. You know, why would he do that? You know, the, the shore there for the Sea of Galilee is not super steep, but it does slope down to the sea level or the uh, water level, technically the Sea of Galilee is not at sea level. It's at 767 feet below sea level. It's like having a big deep lake in uh, Death Valley, California, which is the only place we have that's below sea level in America. But the Sea of Galilee is below sea level, and then the Jordan River flows downhill from there to get to the Dead Sea, 
which is 1,350 or 1,400 feet below sea level, uh, just for geographical marveling. So I always think that's fascinating. So anyway, so he got on the boat, and the reason he did that, he could sit on the boat or stand in the boat, and he could talk back to them and bounce his voice off the water and actually would help to spread his voice further. It was, a, it was you know, an intelligent thing to do, but Christ never did anything that wasn't intelligent. And he spoke many things to them in parables. So here's the parable. Behold, the sower went out to sow. He was going to go plant the seeds, in other words. And he sowed, and some seed fell by the wayside. The wayside would be along the edge where the trails were, where people walked by, livestock moved by, wagons maybe. By the wayside, and, and some seed, uh, sorry, he sowed some seed, and it fell by the wayside, and the birds came down and devoured it because it was laying on top of the ground. And some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because of the warm earth, because of the rocks being solar collectors. Immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and they became, they had no root, and they withered away. And then the third kind of soil, some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, just like the Canadian thistle would do with the cornfield. But others, other seeds, fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold. So you plant one seed, you got a hundred seeds back. Uh, some 60, some 30, he who has ears, let him hear. In other words, whenever Christ says, he who has ears, let him hear, he says, you better think about this. And we want, I want you to think about this, as he certainly does. Now we'll go to the version of it in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to come back and analyze it after we're done here. Luke 8. And uh, it begins in verse 4. Luke has longer chapters than Matthew. Here we are. In uh, chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, they came to him from every city, and he spoke by a parable. He used a parable to teach. If you understood this story, it's kind of like a riddle, the parable is. But if you understand what is the key to it, then there's a tremendous amount of teaching. So we're going to be looking at this particular parable today. And a great multitude gathered, they came from every city. He spoke by a parable. And here it was, verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. So it was trampled down because it was on the, the, the trail, on the path beside it, the road, the roadbed. Verse 6, some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, meaning that it wasn't sitting actually on rock, it was sitting on a thin layer of dirt sitting on top of the rock, which was warm, as I said, it sprang up and it withered away because it lacked moisture. In other words, it used up the moisture in that thin soil very quickly. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground and sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears, let him hear. In other words, think about it. So we're going to think about that. We're going to analyze it. Uh, and understand this parable and see how we can put it to work in our lives uh, directly today and maybe how others can as well in our modern time. First, though, let's analyze the purpose of parables. We need to know why Christ used this as a teaching tool. And uh, Matthew uh, covered it. We'll go back to that in a minute. But first, we're going to read what it says uh, right here in Luke, uh, verses 9 and 10. This is the purpose of the parables, as Luke was inspired to record it. And his disciples ask him, saying, what does this parable mean? He's like, what do you mean? His disciples didn't figure that out? Right. I mean, they didn't have the knowledge that we have of Christ and of the prophecies about him and who he really was and all these things that we have now. So they were just learning that. Nobody else had it either. So they didn't understand what the parable meant. And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. In other words, 
they wouldn't understand until I let them understand. Sort of a delayed action teaching is what it is. Now let's go back to Matthew and look at how he defines the purpose of parables there. Again, Matthew 13, same chapter we were in. Matthew 13, verse 10. So after he'd given the parable of the sower, which is right there in the first uh, uh, nine verses of this chapter, Matthew 13, we come to verse 10. And the disciples came and, and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? They could have said, why do you speak to us in parables? <laughs> they didn't understand it either. And he answered and he said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are the same thing. God resides in heaven. God is the owner of the kingdom. Uh, so it's the kingdom of heaven or it's the kingdom of God either way. But to them it has not been given, at least not yet. It will be eventually. Uh, for God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For whoever, verse 12, for whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy was fulfilled, which Isaiah said, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of the people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, and that I should heal them. And we would think, well, why doesn't Christ want to heal them? Well, he does at the right time. He has a plan that's being worked out here below. But you can see uh, the, the meaning of the parables as Jesus Christ himself explained them as a teaching tool. Traditional Christianity doesn't often like to comment on the parables, especially not this part of the parable that some won't understand, um, because they, they think it's hopeless. In other words, he's only teaching a few, and the others don't have a chance to understand. And the reason that they think that is because they think that this is the only day of salvation. Traditional Christianity doesn't understand God's plan because they think we have immortal souls and we're going to heaven or we're going to an ever-burning hell, one or the other. None of that is in the Bible. That's, those are pagan doctrines draw, drawn from pagan religions. But mankind has been fooled um, by the devil, certainly, and deceived, and so that's why that has been incorporated into the belief system. We don't look at it that way. See, we have a bigger picture. God has opened our eyes and minds to understand his plan. Now, God has three days of salvation. See, they think there's only one day of salvation, so if, if he's not going to heal them or he's not going to save them, then he's just throwing them into hell for what reason? As they would view it. But, in fact, God has three days of salvation or three eras of salvation. Number one is during the age of man, when God's church is called out of the world and called to true salvation. That's happening as we live it, from minute to minute and hour to hour and day to day. We're part of that. We have been called out of the world ahead of time. We few, we happy few, as one of the uh, Shakespearean plays said. But what's the, what are the other two days of salvation? Number two is the millennium. When Christ returns, he will govern the nations from Jerusalem. And as resurrected saints, we will be assisting. And all nations will be called to repentance who are then repopulating the earth. Bear in mind from the end time prophecies, you know that the destruction is dire leading up to the return of Christ. And so we will have a much reduced population compared to our seven and a half plus billion people now, seven and a half billion and counting. And that, that, that's, that's actually from about a year and a half or two years ago, so I'm sure we're closer to eight billion now. We're, we're closing in on eight billion people on Earth. How much of that will, how, how much shrinkage will there be of the population? 
by the time Christ has returned and the millennium begins? I don't know. I think it'll be drastic. But thankfully, not complete at all. There will be nations. They'll be identifiable as nations. There will be survivors. And as the resurrected saints, those who we, that's who we start to work with. And then those people will repopulate the earth. But that's the, their day of salvation, too. Those who survive into the millennium, those who are born in the millennium. That will be their day. That will be their time to know the truth like we know it now. The whole world will know it. The whole culture will be God's culture rather than like it is today. We strive to recapture, as we say, and, and these, these statements that we have from our history are timeless and profound, recapture the true values. That's what we do. This age needs the true values. They will be the rule of, of God uh, through Christ. They will be the values of the millennium. So that's the second day of salvation. Now, you only get one day personally. We're called now. This is our day of salvation. Those who are called and live during the millennium, that's their day of salvation. And, but we say, well, if that's the millennium, repopulating the world and, and, and the church being truly, as we use the adjective, worldwide, and it will be, dramatically so, because the population has got to be gigantic by the end of the millennium, especially the cumulative population, what's the third day of salvation? And the answer to that comes on the last great day of the feast, because it is the great white throne judgment and pictured by the, the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles and last great day, the last holy day of the, of the year. The Great White Throne Judgment, which is preceded by the second resurrection, bringing back to physical life all who never, who had lived, everybody who had lived clear back to Adam and Eve's time, but never understood God's truth, hadn't been called to repentance. God has only called a few in the time that we've lived, coming from Adam down to, you know, the modern time. He's only called a very few, and we are among those very few. Really rare. It's not a wave of action where you can just see the, the people swelling in numbers and growing dramatically. It's, it's very small, and we've been smaller even more over the past few decades. But that doesn't matter. God is still working his work. The great white throne judgment is where he brings back to physical life, resurrects them in a physical resurrection, everybody who ever lived that never knew the truth of God. All the nations, you know, all the population, every individual in all those nations, they will live again. And in their second lifetime, they will have their first chance to know God's truth. And they will make their decision then. Will they repent? And, and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We hope so. We hope that they all will. We hope that we all will endure to the end of this age. So there's the setting. That's why the parables are awkward in traditional Christianity, and they tend to draw other lessons from them rather than what we do when we just read what Christ said and put it into the matrix that comes from the prophecies that are recorded in Scripture to understand how God is working and where. So now let's, let's look at the next point. Let's explain the parable of the sower. And uh, we'll just uh, go back, and we're here in Matthew 13. Let me read it here again, uh, beginning in verse 18. Here's the explanation in Matthew. Uh, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. He received some knowledge of God's way, but it was snatched right out. Never had a chance to really get underway. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, the soil on the stony ground, the thin soil with a lot of rocks in it, he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And we have had very many of those 
in conjunction in connection with God's church in our age that endured for a while. And we looking back, we would figure that they weren't converted. They didn't have the fruits of God's spirit that would enable them to endure. And so again, Satan snatched it away from them in that sense. Now, uh, and uh, he has no root in himself, endures only for a while. For when the tribulation and persecution begin, arises because of the word, he immediately stumbles. Now, verse 22. Now, he who received the seed among thorns is he who hears the words and the cares of this life, uh, rather of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So that's the one that's in the soil like our cornfield with the Canadian thistles. You got to get rid of the thistles. He who received the seed, verse 23, of the good ground, it came onto good ground, is he who hears the word and understands it. Obviously, God is working with him that he understands it. It isn't just uh, uh, a minute spiritual reaction and a very large emotional reaction. It is a powerful spiritual reaction that it happens for some. He hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. That's why, brethren, quite frankly, why we're here. Still keeping God's way when others we know have walked away from God's way. And we're in the United Church of God, not the only faithful ones. There are other organizations, as we know, of the church, uh, which, you know, has problematic issues of its own, but still there are it's valuable to know that. Luke, uh, now we go back to Luke. I want to read it in Luke this time. It starts in, back in chapter 8 of Luke, where we will spend a good share of the re rest of the sermon here. Luke 8. The parable of the sower explained begins in verse 11 of Luke 8. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay. You know, the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is essentially the teaching of the word of God. Those who are by the wayside are those who hear, but the devil comes and he takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They hear it, and they're impressed by it, but they don't follow it. You know, there were many in Herbert Armstrong's day that heard, heard the broadcast or saw the telecast, but especially the broadcast back in the radio days, and they were impressed. They were impacted by it. In, in the long run, they will, that will still be a benefit when their day of, of salvation and opportunity to, to be in the church comes, but it was snatched away. Society was going a different direction, and they weren't, that wasn't their time. But in verse uh, 13, but the ones on the rock, that is the thin soil on the rocks, are those when they hear, receive the word with joy, but they have no root, and they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. They're all excited to begin with and then drift. Well, they're not lost, as they haven't made that commitment yet to where they're being judged. Uh, so we'll capitalize on what they remember after they're brought back to life in the future. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. In other words, they don't really grow. They get caught up in the cares of life and it, it short circuits what they had begun to commit themselves to. We, we all know people, maybe even some brethren, in years past who were in that category. Maybe, maybe loved ones, family members that were excited about relearning certain things, but as they began to digest what that meant, they weren't so interested. But that's okay. We're planting the seeds in many minds, and then we will have the few that God will call, which would, even a few, would make our numbers swell dramatically. Now, verse 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground, the terrific soil, are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, 
Keep it and bear fruit with patience. That's what we are trying to do. Those descriptors there should be goal, not goals, but op operating terms for us. This is what we want to be right there in verse 15. Okay, so let's, let's analyze it. Now that we go back to the dirt and do a soil analysis, let's look at this hard-packed trail dirt to begin with. Uh, they hear the word, as we read in verse 11 and 12 there. They hear the word, but they do nothing about it. And then we remember what God said through Matthew in chapter 22 and verse 14. Matthew 22 and verse 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. Or you can do the winter version of that one. Many are cold, but few are frozen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, we have empty chairs probably in every congregation that we have in United, except for those that live, <laughs> meet in, a, in a, you know, somebody's living room. And we wish those chairs were filled with people with the desire and the zeal that we all share right now. Well, they will eventually. In this age, maybe. Maybe God will energize us. That uh, would be great, but we know they will be filled in the long run, getting into the millennium and into the great white throne judgment. Many are called and few are chosen. This is the, the ones that are on that, that hard packed dirt that where you can't get enough to germinate. And likely they never made it to God's church, or maybe they were church kids, quote unquote kids, who walked from the truth. Uh, notice uh, Ephesians chapter 6. You might want to keep something there to turn back to Luke. We'll come back there. But in Ephesians chapter 6, let's notice this, which makes us analyze the, par the parable in that way. Chapter 6 of Ephesians, we want to look at the first four verses, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother, or father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You think, first commandment with promise? Wow, what's the promise? That you may live long upon the earth and prosper. The Vulcans knew it. Um, live long and prosper, summarizes it. That's the, that's the promise Paul's referring to. And then verse 3, and that it may be well with you and that you may live long upon the earth. And then verse 4, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So you teach your children, you teach them firmly, certainly, but don't provoke them to wrath. Now, there's a whole study right there on child rearing, uh, because that can drive them away from wanting to commit to this way of life. And it does, and it has, and we know that. Some recover from it, and then they come back. Some don't. They've, that's it. I'm not interested. Well, they're not interested now, but they really haven't had their day yet. They'll either be in the millennium or in the white throne judgment, and we are thankful to know that. Now, and again, the hard-packed soil makes it hard for those who are on that kind of soil or in that kind of a mindset that compares to hard-packed soil, the trail dirt where the road is, it, it then it changes their mindset. You know, it's, I can remember the hard-packed soil. I, I rode a tilde uh, field. While I was at Ambassador College in England, we had a, most people think the only research farm we had was in the big sandy campus of Ambassador College back in, the, in those days, in the 70s. But actually, we had a research farm in England as well. Um, we had, uh, the basic farm was 200 acres, um, then we leased land, and then we did some land reclamation because we were only about a mile and a half from uh, the beginning of a, a large landfill that was done, it's the rubbish of London came up there and was buried. So we would go and try to work at reclaiming after they put raw, some soil back on top of the landfill. We would work at reclaiming that, planting things to rebuild the soil and make something productive out of what they had there. Well, then that got some neighbors' attention and they wanted us to, you know, work some land of theirs. So with this field needed to be rototilled and the boss said, do it just once which meant I put my rototiller on crawl, or what rototiller? It was behind a John Deere tractor, a 3010. 
Uh, so I uh, put it in the crawl gear and just let it crawl along to the field. But there was a footpath in the middle of it. And England is honeycombed with, with footpaths every, everywhere, the vast network of public footpaths. We don't have that in America. But over there, you could walk from one end of England, zigzag fashion, and then come back and not walk except to intersect the trails that you crossed. Those public footpaths, they go right through fields. And so there was one that went right through the field. So I would come to the footpath, and as soon as my front tires hit it, I'd flip and hit the lever, and up would come the rototiller, and I'd roll over it and drop down off the footpath, and I'd drop the rototiller again so that I wouldn't do any damage to the footpath. They, it goes right through pastures where livestock live, and they have styles. Sometimes the styles are sets of stairs where they climb up over the fence, you know, just going up the stairs, and there's a little handrail, and then down again. Um, then they have another one is a blind style, or I think that's, that's what I call it anyway. They have a gap in the fence of about three feet wide, which a cow could get through if they could see that it was there. And then just outside the fence, like two or three, about three feet past the fence, they have another stretch of fence. So when a cow looks at the hole in the fence of the pasture that they're standing in, all they see is fence. Cows are really nice you know, creatures. They're not that smart. And so you fool them consistently. But those are, those are gates that the footpaths will sometimes use going through people's farms. It's remarkable. So there are, the paths, though, the footpaths get to be hard packed and rocky. But they put some gravel on them, and then people walk on them a lot or bicycle on them. Uh, and therefore, they're the hard packed soil. They make a classic example of that soil to type number one, the trail dirt. Now, soil type number two is shallow and rocky. So let's note that uh, back here in Luke again. Verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word with joy, they have no root. These have no root who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. So shallow and rocky. And they're excited about the truth when they find out about it. And we hear from these people every so often, even today. And they call or uh, and want to talk about God's truth. And you wait to find out if they actually are interested or if God's, you know, the devil's going to snatch away what they've already learned. But it brings a good question for us as we look at these. You know, is our attitude hard-packed uh, trail dirt? Or in the, the shallow, rocky soil, how shallow or how deep are we as true Christians? You know, do we have some place for roots to set down a home and really dig in and pull the nutrients up to the plant? Or are we stunted spiritually? You know, we have to answer those. And, and the beauty of knowing this is then we have remedies. <laughs> we can fix that. How shallow are we? Is your Christianity skin deep or bone deep, you might ask? Backgrounds sometimes affect the shallow and rocky. Those who are overjoyed with the truth at first, as it said there in Luke 8 and verse 13, some backgrounds come after a person. Some who are involved in crime, crime doesn't want to let you go. And if they don't re resolve to get away from it, it will pull them back. Some are involved in sexual immorality of whatever kind, and that can pull them back out of the church and into the world. Same with drugs, same with the alcohol addiction, bad friends. You think about it, the shallow and rocky those are the things you want to avoid if, if you find yourself in this in any way. And it helps you understand others, even if it didn't apply directly. Do you understand what others are facing and how to encourage them along? So shallow and rocky is the wrong kind of soil. We don't want that. Now we go to chapter 8 and verse 14. We're going to read about the weedy, uh, the weeds and thorns. Now the ones of Luke 8 and verse 14... Now, the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. 
they don't really come to full repentance. They're too excited, and they're excited about the truth, but they, they're too busy with other things to really take note about it, of it. Choked out by regular friends who influence them to ignore the Sabbath. And they, they're not strong enough to withstand that, and so they end up being uh, like the gospel is landing, you know, the seeds of the gospel landing in a weedy patch. Sometimes work demands, and they, they aren't ready to give up their career and get a, a different career, you know, that they, they know they can't do the one they're doing, so you've got, they've got to weigh that. Sometimes it's sports either because they just like doing sports, or we've even had professional uh, players of some of America's sports have been called into the church. Some have stayed and some haven't. It could be entertainment. It could be any, any number of things that, that a person puts above the calling God has given or is offering. Wealth and status sometimes is put above that. Or is that it could be the pleasures, uh, the routine pleasures of life. We, we want to watch television too much, not read God's word enough. And gradually you get starved out because the soil is, is thin and, and rocky. Uh, playing instead of praying. So let's go, uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and add in another scripture here. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're seeking godliness. We want to be godly. I mean, eventually, we want to be a part of the God family, but we want to be godly right now because we're trying to, we're trying to copy uh, or emulate, it's more than a copy, uh, what Christ was like on earth and what the Father is like and Christ are like in spirit. That's what we want to be. But we have to be focused in, in order to, to, uh, to do that. Verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 6 through verse 10. Uh, now godliness with contentment is great gain. But some are on the cusp of finding godliness, but they aren't content. They haven't given up on that which is wrong in their life that they've got to give up on and repent of. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we should be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, rich can be more than just dollars. It can be rich in all kinds of other things, just the way you want to live. For the, but the love of money, it is true, the love of money, if that's loved too much, now it's no problem working hard and doing well, but when you love money more than you love others or love money more than you love God, oh, then that's all kinds of evil is what that brings. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's, that's not just true for today. That was true for Paul's day in the first century, and very clearly so. So that's soil type number three. You know, it's, it isn't the good fertile soil. It's the soil that's full of weed seeds that will choke out the good crop that should be planted there. Now we go to soil type number four. And this will be good fertile soil, pay dirt, if you want to call it that. You know, they talk about pay dirt for gold mining, but you know, for a farmer, pay dirt is rich, you know, sandy loam that has lots of nutrients and moisture either through the rain or available for irrigation, that kind of, that's the good soil. We, learned, we farmed in South Dakota where we had two soil, soil types in the fields. We had uh, a sandy loam, which was, was really good, uh, and a rich, good rich soil there. And then the other kind of soil, which we had many of our fields, was gumbo. And if you're short and you want to be tall, you wait till it rains. You might have to wait a long time in that part of South Dakota, but it'll rain. And then 
without thinking, you just run out and try to run across a gumbo field, and you'll go three inches in three steps. It, it's stickier than clay. You can grow it. Typically, you'd, you'd increase an inch with every step you take across muddy gumbo. It's, it's powdered shale is what it is. It actually has a lot of nutrients, and if you know how to farm it, it's, it, it does grow good crops, uh, but it is a pain. It's worse than clay in, in a lot of respects, uh, and especially when you never, ever drive in it when it's wet. You'll get about eight feet, and you'll be sitting at the axles of the tractor, and you won't be able to get it out unless you have a bigger tractor that can winch it out. You're going to wait till it gets dry, and then you're going to dig it out. So we didn't do that very often because we were smart. We did it once, <laughs> and that was enough. Uh, so you, you, you have to think about the soil that we have. So we're going to look at the good fertile soil in Luke 8 now. Um, <coughs> and verse 15, Luke 8 and verse 15. Where is it? No, just a second. Good and noble heart. I already did that one. No. Um, yeah, Luke 8 and verse 15. Did I read that? I started, I digressed and derailed my train of thought. Let's go back to look at Luke 8 and verse 15. Here we go. Ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word of the noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Patience. That's very important in bearing fruit. Godliness with contentment is what that's called in, uh, in Timothy, as we, as we read. But you know, we're not always just one soil type. And we had fields like that. They would be gumbo here and, and sandy loam there, and maybe a little streak of clay over there. And as you were running your farm equipment through it, you could tell when you changed soil, soil types because they each had their own signature noise or drag on, you know, the, we used disc harrows instead of plows. We didn't do the big flip, flip of a plow. We used disc harrows and chisel plows. Well, you could tell when you hit a different soil type uh, in that kind of work. So we have the different soil types that we have to work through and we have to come to be good fertile soil, as it says here, the ones that fell on good ground and had, a, had heard the word of noble and good hearts. That's the description. Often, though, we're a mix of types, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we've got to change your soil to be the good soil as much as possible. And you think, well, how do you do that? Well, there are soil building techniques. Organic ones are particularly important. Uh, sometimes we did green manuring, uh, which is, the, and we use that at technique at the research farm in England. That was the way to reclaim soil fast. We would plant ryegrass. But the ryegrass would come up even in lousy nutrients, and when it would get up about this high, then we'd go in and mulch mow the thing. We had a heavy-duty mulch mower that would just mulch mower that down to, you know, fine ma uh, m um, sort of a mash of of the uh, vegetation, and then we come back and chisel or and, and rototill that back into the soil. And that would put a huge amount of natural nitrogen back into the soil, plus a lot of plant fiber that would go in to help to build it. And by doing that, we would give a jump start on the soil and, and in the experimental plots that we were using to build back up. Quite fascinating. All the different types of soil you had to be aware of in working with that. How to change your soil type is our final question. There, there's one of the about the final question we want to get to. Uh, we'll look at each aspect, Luke 8 again, since we're there. Uh, verse uh, 16 to 8, no, just a minute, let me, I've got this turned over on the wrong side. No, no I don't, here we are. How to change your soil type. Take heed how you hear God's word. We want to look at verse 16 of Luke chapter 8. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but he sets it on a lampstand that those who enter it may see the light. Nothing is secret that will not be revealed or anything hidden that will not be known. Therefore, take heed how you hear, for whoever has to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. 
we want to build soil fertility and spiritual soil fertility. Take heed how you hear God's word preached, silently in your head. This is how to change your soil type. Listen intently. Evaluate your soil type. You know, which one do we sort of fall into? And, and don't use defense, don't let your defense mechanisms operate. It's a psychological term. That's just a defense mechanism when they object, oh, it doesn't apply to me. That's a defense mechanism is usually how that's described. And some defense mechanisms are actually correct if it doesn't apply. But many times we want to ignore what we need to deal with, and so we can't use the defense mechanisms. Therefore, we need to analyze our soil type or our spiritual condition, as it were, without the defense mechanism. Be willing to listen to what God is saying. That's usually done in prayer, studying the Bible and praying. And then you, we come to the point where we're resolved to change. Now, let me give you a classic example in Acts chapter 2 uh, of how this happened here and how it was described by the people it was happening to. Now, obviously, this is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. This was the beginning of the true church of God um, back at the time. And notice how they, the people who were listening responded. And these would be the pioneer core of God's true church. Prior to this time, it was scattered individuals, prophets mainly, and just a few in the Old Testament era. Now the church would be considerably more, not vastly more in the sense of overtaking the world, but it would be considerably more. So in verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, Peter said to them, repent, this is the conclusion of his sermon, repent and let every one of you, uh, sorry, it isn't his conclusion, let's go to verse 36, that all the house of Israel, I'm backing up now to verse 36, know that assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, now we come to verse 37. When they heard this, when they heard that, that they were responsible for the death of their own Messiah, and Savior. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the step they needed to take to change their soil type. And then Peter answered with what I started to read, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. What shall we do? We have to come to that point. What shall we do point? And then we start to make progress. Now, let's look at soil type one. What shall we do if you think that you have a lot of this hard-packed soil in your life, this, this attitude that isn't listening to God? Well, if you find or you believe that you have that, you need God's help. So James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, explains the kind of help that a person needs in this situation. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. I'll begin in verse 2. I'll just take the whole paragraph, but the latter part of it is, is where the crux is. My brethren, verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may per be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, approach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting, you know, genuinely ask God for help. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man, for let not that man suppose he'll be, receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in his ways. We want to be stable in our ways, single-minded and stable. And we want to ask God to help us to receive his way. If we feel like we are, our lives are hard-packed dirt, then we just need basic help, 101, from God directly. Soil type number two. This is the stony soil. Stony soil with rocks, 
It means that the soil is thin and there's a lot of rocks. The rocks collect heat. It's hot soil, but it doesn't have any, any staying power. Throw out your rocks. What is it in your life that are like stepping on, tripping on, and driving on big rocks? If you're on a rock shelf or gravel bed, then pick up your soil and move to a better source of subsoil. Now that seems a bit odd, but you could do that. Frankly, we kind of did that with some of the, uh, the soil rejuvenation experiments that we did reclaiming land from landfills there in, in England back in the Ambassador College days. Some of places we tried weren't any good. They didn't have enough soil on top of the trash, as it were. So then we would shift our experiments to some place where they did, or we'd have them bring more soil in, explain it's just too thin. We've got to have more. For the, you know, basically you're doing a change-up game. You know, this is, I don't have enough soil here, it's too stony, I need more dirt and less rocks. So you need to change something. Something, uh, many things could be changed. You need to change how much media time you're, you're spending in your life and how much you're com comparing that to how much you're studying God's way and word. Uh, you may need to change your, your acquaintances or rather your people you spend time with. French President Charles de Gaulle, remember him? He was about six foot six. Um, he led the Free French in World War II. That was all that was left of the French army, was the Free French pretty much after the Germans overran it. Uh, and the Free French were evacuated from Dunkirk with the British soldiers, and so then they were based in England until they could be redeployed back, and de Gaulle was their, was their general. So he became prime minister after the war, and at that time France had, as part of their tiny empire compared to Britain's large one, they had French Algiers across the Straits of Gibraltar in northern Africa. And uh, so he was president of them, too. And uh, one of the politicians there was meeting with him, and he explained, he says, I, I would love to support your policies, you know, um, uh, General, Grant, uh, General de Gaulle, but what would my friends think? And he, uh, that's all in English, they would be speaking in French. So Charles de Gaulle, who could come out with a very penetrating short answer, he just said, changez-vous, changez vos amis, change your friends. You know, you're in the wrong group, the wrong party, change your friends. Sometimes that we, that's what we have to do. Change bad friends for good ones. Create positive peer pressure if you're on stony ground. If your soil type is more the weedy soil, soil type three, what do you do then? Well, you pull those weeds. Figure out which ones are the weeds. That's important. Don't go pulling good things and pull the weeds. Root out false teachings. You know, we have that and floating through the church. We always have. Uh, some people think that they're not satisfied with God's way and they need to be more Jewish. I don't know why they would think that, but they do. And so they, they are all enamored with the uh, you know, Messianic Jewish movement or being involved, just being more Jewish generally. You don't need to do that. Some think they have to say words and even the name of God only in Hebrew. Well, do you sure you're pronouncing it right? You may not be. It's not magic, you know, God's way isn't magic. Others have gotten involved in the sacred names, which is similar, except it doesn't lean toward the Jewish uh, applications. Bear in mind, Judaism uh, of today is rabbinical Judaism, which means it's the Pharisees. Now, how well did Christ get along with the Pharisees? Yet that is what modern Judaism's ancestor is, it comes out of Pharisaical, Pharisaism. Now, that's just, I don't know that everybody knows that, but that's, that's certainly the case. Others want to sound Protestant, so they do the Jesus talk. Try to use the jargon that they hear uh, done by traditional Christianity. That's all they've got. They, that's all they know, because they don't understand God's word like we do. 
It's walking backwards, not forwards. We need to root out false teachings, rid our life of worldly cares, and commit more faithfully to the Father and to Christ. Keep the Sabbath holy. Love your family. Use your resources wisely for good. Now, that's how we use the parable of the sower and the soil. Soil type number four is good soil. So what if you are, you think that you are in good soil? Well, we all are probably to a significant degree, and I hope so. Uh, but good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. Dig and dung. And uh, don't worry about the word dung, it's in the King James. Uh, there was the, the man that Christ told his parable, and there was a landowner, and this tree wasn't producing, I think it was figs it was supposed to be producing, and it wasn't producing figs, and he said, cut that tree down. And his, his gardener said, oh, master, let me, let me dig and dung around it for a year or two and see if we can revive it. And then if it doesn't produce, then we'll take it down. And so the master said, okay, you know, dig and dung. Get into God's word, think about God's way, meditate on it, become fertile soil in the hands of Christ and the Father. That's our goal, brethren. And like I said, good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. Finally, we're going to end up in Luke chapter 8, our last verse here, last passage. So here's one more lesson, and this is the chapter that had the parables in it. So he was telling the parables, and then in verse 19, his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. Now, that would have been true if he was down by the seashore. Remember, he got in the boat and he was talking to them and telling them uh, this, this lesson about the soil, the parable about the soil. Well, Mary and his brothers couldn't get to him uh, because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. And Christ, in the midst of teaching these lessons, he turned to the person and said, said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And you think, wow, is that kind of harsh to his mother and his brothers? No. He used... He used the question to turn right over and give the object lesson, give the lesson right back. He loved his mother. He loved his brothers, and he had sisters too. Which, by the way, this scripture defeats the idea that Christ didn't have any siblings, uh, taught by one of the major or the major traditional Christian denomination. Now, he wasn't dissing his mother or his brothers. He was talking about how his spiritual brethren, the spiritual brethren, need to stay close to God and to grow in grace and knowledge, to hear the word of God and do it. Well, we too can be in the family of Christ. We need to prepare our soil and sow our crop of spiritual success. And don't forget the adage, good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better best.